Naveen, are you ready? Uh, I think ready. we can fire this up. I'll keep an eye out for any new people showing up. Um, but yeah, so Naveen uh, joined our, well, he may have joined a while ago, but he started showing up in uh, imaging meetings not that long ago. And he had done a cool project where he um, built a barn door from scratch and was kind of getting his feet wet with that. And I think that got him his, his hunger up. So he's apparently getting a much more serious imaging rig put together now. He's going to talk about that decision process and give us some hints to how to navigate all the stuff in the uh, marketplace these days. So I'll let you take over, Naveen. All right, thanks. Um, not sure about all, but you know, at least what I've hit on. <laughs> we were just talking before recording started, like cameras or something I need to dig into more. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I joined the club. At, uh, well, my kids got a telescope in December, uh, and right at the conjunction of uh, Saturn and Jupiter. So looking through an eight inch Dobsonian at those was mind blowing and I've been hooked ever since. I've spent gobs of time working on the barn door tracker and learning how to process and it's been a lot of fun. So I'm glad to share my approach. Uh, faster photography, uh, just quick definition that probably everybody knows, but you know, just think of it as imaging anything that's not on the earth. So I read on some posts and places like maybe sunsets are not in scope, but you know, it's got the sun in it, so whatever. I like the loose interpretation. Um, just a quick fact, uh, the first attempt at this was in 1839 of the moon, which is pretty cool, so uh, been around for quite a while. Um, so a, a timely email thread uh, today about <laughs> buying philosophies, I'm not gonna dive into it too deeply, but uh, Two camps that I've heard of, and maybe there's you know, nuances and something in between or on the outside edges, but buy once, cry once, or buy, learn, and trade up. And I just want to put that in there because, like, I'm in the buy once, cry once. So when I approach this, and the reason why I, I do the analysis I'm doing is like I'm trying to figure out what I need to know before I go buy stuff. Uh, not that I wouldn't at some point decide to, you know, trade in something, but I'd like. I like to look at data as kind of a thing that I enjoy. I have an engineering background, um, architecture background, software architecture. So that, that's where I am. Um, it's all very personal. So if you take away nuggets and not the whole presentation, it's applicable to, to your space and that's great. That's a win. Um, so I'm just going to talk through quick challenges before we dive into the things that I've been looking at for gear. Um, you've got, of course, you're trying to take images of objects in, a, uh, in the sky, deep space, or deep sky objects. You've got the earth rotating, you've got it revolving around the sun. Um, there's things like planets are going to be moving relative uh, to the background stars and you know local vibration. Those are all things you need to, to deal with to get a clean image. And then you've got noise. Uh, a lot of different sources, light pollution. So I'm in a city. Um, the moon is not out right now, but we've got clouds. So by the time it comes out again, I'm, uh, the clouds are gone. I think we're going to be fighting the moon. Um, if you're shooting low in the atmosphere, you get distortions from that as well as you're know, more likely to have light shining up from cities. Um, your telescope can have chromatic aberrations, which is where the focal the, the different wavelengths focus at different points. Uh, so you get some weird colorings. Uh, cameras have noise as you're taking images. Uh, clouds can pass over airplanes, satellites, UFOs, whatever. There's a lot of, lot of sources for noise. And then there's environmental challenges. Uh, the big one here in North Carolina uh, that's bit me uh, twice now, hopefully never again, is humidity. So that one is uh, really important. Uh, we're about to hit pollen season, so there's the particulates in the air, you know, pollen settling on your mirror or your, your lens. Um, I just got a new telescope and it's got a nice tight fitting cap, but it's got a felt ring. So there's a lot of lint from that I had to deal with initially. So, and of course, you know, mosquitoes, if you're out in the wild, you know, there's deer, bears, dogs, like I've, I've been out at Harris Lake 
couple times at night and it can be kind of freaky with some of the noises and around you. Um, and then the you know, big challenge for <laughs> everybody is like, how much are you willing to spend? Uh, this is um, maybe maybe cheaper than buying a boat, but it's you know it's a, an expensive hobby. Uh, depends on how far you go. Like I haven't gotten into boat territory yet, but we'll see. So when looking at surmounting these challenges, you know, compensating for movement, and you're looking at having a stable platform, being able to track uh, your objects in space so that you're you know compensating for uh, the movement of the Earth and potentially if you know planetary as an example or, or lunar, you're also compensating for the movement of those objects. Uh, to do that, you need really good polar alignment and then to do even better, you need guiding. Uh, as far as noise reduction, you know, hope, you know, look for when the moon is not gonna be shining really bright in the sky. Uh, there's options of filters, traveling to other sites that might have less noise or light pollution. Uh, make sure you have good optics. Um, not, I'm going to note, it's not necessarily like if you're starting out, I wouldn't sweat too much that if you have an existing telescope, try it out. Um, you can deal with a lot in post. Um, <laughs> I was using a kit lens from Canon until this week. Um, you learn a lot using that kind of gear still. Um, calibration frames, um, I'm not going to get into that in this presentation, but astronomy cameras, they, they help to reduce a lot of noise. And then of course, you know, looking at the forecast for imaging, uh, whether it's important, is there gonna be clouds, it's the transparency, et cetera. And for the environment, uh, dew heaters are a must. Uh, being aware of dust and having strategies for dealing with it and, you know, get some bug spray maybe when mosquitoes start to come out. Um, so this isn't trivial stuff. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of nuance in how each and every setup is going to work. You're probably going to have something different from most other people we ever talk about. Uh, your journey is going to be different than mine, than anybody else. Um, my personal recommendation, you know, remember to buy once, cry once, uh, start with what you already have, see what you can learn. Um, I kind of like forcing myself to do things the hard way. To, to get some knowledge about how stuff works, then I feel more, um, I feel I can do more when I, I get something that's easier because I, I, I know I understand a little bit more the nuance that I have the inner workings of how things function. And then again, I, I like to plan for the future. So what am I, what do I want to do long-term? Um, is that, you know, the trade-up option for long-term, that's perfectly viable for me. I'm looking at, uh, you know, trying not to spend uh, you know, to buy buy stuff over and over, <laughs> try and, and buy it once, but I, I probably will fail. Uh, I've already bought a couple of tea rings, so like I'm on number three or four. So yeah, little little thing, but you know, <laughs> uh, they add up. Um, so I, I just a little bit of my journey. So the the Canon 300 millimeter lens. This is a, just a shot untracked at 30 seconds. Just kind of interesting, like how much trailing there is, and then. Um, as mentioned, I, I built a barn door tracker. My first version was literally a couple two by fours on a hinge and hand cranked uh, handle. You turn it once a minute. It was excruciating. It was cold. Uh, you can see the stars are wobbly. Like humans are not good at this. <laughs> but at two and a half minutes, I was pretty cool proof of concept. Uh, so I dove in to building my own curved rod tracker. So this is 3D printed. It's got a Raspberry Pi Pico controlling it um, and you know a bit of an improvement this is moving from two and a half minutes to almost 39 minutes uh, with the uh, m42 but um, things like Pleiades I didn't get as much time on it but 15 minutes it doesn't look that great uh, in my mind uh, my mom was like oh that's pretty but that's not what I wanted to take a picture of <laughs> so I've got this now after doing all my light work, uh, feel comfortable making the purchase. This is what I decided to grab. Uh, William Optics, Cena Star 73, with the Field Flattener and EQ6R from uh, Skywatcher. We had some clear skies this week. I got 44 minutes with subs that were probably too long. 
uh, but quite an improvement on uh, Pleiades. So as I said, I'm, I'm planning already, like, do I want to get an Astro camera guiding you know, ASI air? I need dew heaters for sure. Uh, I don't want to have to deal with uh, condensation. Uh, maybe longer focal length telescope at some point. These uh, galaxies that are coming along are pretty tiny, uh, et cetera. So there's more to come. All right, into how to approach the problems and surmounting them, things to think about. So with a stable platform, you know, some of this is not gonna be specifically gear, but I, I felt it was useful to just hit it in case folks haven't the context of uh, get, just getting into the space. So your contact with the ground is really important. Um, vibration gets transferred up into your rig, which transfers into the, your image and it can, you know, we saw the, the manual tracking uh, wobbly stars and maybe not that bad, but it's not gonna be great. Things like wooden decks, if, if somebody steps on them nearby, it's gonna cause vibrations as an example. Concrete sounds stable uh, in the summer, it's gonna get really hot. If it's been sitting in the sun, it'll radi radiate heat, which can cause other problems. Um, and then I've got loose soil in my backyard where I've been setting up and it's just like, it's just the best place I can set up, uh, unfortunately. But, you know, we get settling from that, you might have to, to think about. Uh, when it, whatever you put your imaging train on needs to be pretty stable, um, tripod or pedestal. Uh, what I've seen, of course, you know, heavier tends to be more stable, costs more, it's less mobile. Um, of course, if you're, if your journey is you, you want to move, you know, be able to take it on an airplane or something, you're not going to be able to get the mountain I did. It's, it's a beast. Uh, when you set them up, consider how high you set them up. I started off, I set mine up the first night as high as the tripod would go. And I don't have uh, a guide camera yet. So I just have an eyepiece in my uh, finder scope. And it was, I had to stretch to get up high enough to look through it. So, uh, but lower it is, it's more stable. I also have dogs. I don't want them messing with it. So I'm probably gonna go somewhere in the middle. Um, I mentioned things to consider dogs. You know, there's also, I've seen like little hockey puck looking things to put underneath tripod legs or vibration dampeners. I don't know how much uh, a benefit they in part haven't looked at them, but things like that you might want to look into. Um, I'll pause here. Any questions? And I'll try and pause after each of these just in case, you know, comments or questions from the group. Oh, uh, Ron here. Uh, I have a comment about the tripod settling in the ground. A good trick for that is that if you've got sort of a tip part on the tripod, you can put a Gymungus fender washer on the back side of it. And then the, pot, then the tripod weight mass will settle down and it'll stop more on that fender washer. Okay. I got into that a lot when I tried to go out in the field in Colorado, um, where it uh, wasn't as bad as it falling down a rabbit hole, but it could happen. All right. Good tip. Thank you. Uh, no, I think you're doing great. And uh, yeah, just keep going. Mm -hmm. I'll keep an eye out for questions, but okay. it's a good idea to stop occasionally. Thanks. All right. um, for tracking, there's more types of mounts than this, the, the two main ones that I've seen, you know, German Equatorial Mount and Alt Azimuth Mount. Um, yeah, besides the obvious things like cost, um, the biggest factor I believe is the German equatorial is going to keep your image framed and, and rotates with the uh, movement of the sky, whereas the alt azimuth, it's going to more, it, the effect, effectively the pictures you take are going to rotate relative to each other, which could work if you have one, you know, don't think you can't use it. Image stacking can handle rotating them, um, but you just won't get the full frame. Uh, so if you're starting out fresh without anything like me, uh, the, the gem was uh, what I decided to, to go for. Uh, a couple things to think about for uh, mounts, of course, the, the style, there's more out of the, those are the two common ones, gem and XE. What's the weight limit? Like how much can you put on the mount? Uh, and how much does it weigh? Uh, depending on uh, 
what you can lift physically, like that could be a limiting factor. Uh, mine's quite a beast. I've told my kids they're not allowed to touch it because if it falls, they're going to break the floor in their foot. <laughs> um, does the mount have uh, like go-to capabilities and you plug in a target and it just slews to that target? Uh, I'll tell you, moving from manually trying to see objects through a Canon view, uh, camera viewport to just punching it in to the mount, it's been really, really nice. Uh, the rates there to contract, like this one's not necessarily much of a problem, you know, side reel to compensate for uh, movement of the earth around the sun and, and rotation around its axis, lunar, solar, planetary, uh, some mounts have more options as well. Uh, does it come with a tripod? Some don't, so make sure you check that out. Uh, and also pay attention to how sturdy it is, uh, if that's something that's important to you. What are the power requirements? None of these, I mean, they all, all require power of some sort. Um, and then, you know, are you planning for the future you know, growth? Like, as I said, I'm the buy once, cry once kind of guy. So my setup is, the, my mount is quite uh, oversized for what I currently have, but um, quite happy with. All right, noise reduction. So in telescopes, uh, chromatic aberration, so failure of the lens to focus all colors to the same point. So this one is pretty important for um, imaging. Uh, again, like if you already have a telescope or you have a camera and you just wanna try something out without committing additional money, go for it. My camera lens I was using, kit lens, absolutely had problems. <laughs> uh, got a lot of purpling for stars, but you know, can deal with a lot of that in post-processing and at least learn something about the process. But APOs have low to no uh, chromatic aberration, uh, extra low dispersion ED has low, and then uh, achromatic, maybe not, I don't, I didn't look much into that. I assume those are probably better for like visual astronomy. But again, if you, if you got something, see, if it, see what you can get out of it imaging wise. Um, the number of lenses is a factor. Uh, the more lenses you have, the more it costs, the more chances of there being issues in manufacturing, uh, but the better the image results could be. Uh, personal, personal prep, your own personal journey there. Uh, the focuser is pretty important. Like I've not really seen too much on the focusers for most of the APO telescopes. They all seem pretty good, but um, making sure you have something that has fine adjustment and think about whether you wanna put a autofocuser on it and how, how you might do that uh, could be a factor if that's something you're, you're looking into. And then there's a slew of accessories to consider. Uh, most of the telescopes that you buy need to have a, a field flattened, otherwise you get um, stars streaking in the corners. I didn't look into what, what the difference is with coma, that's a, a thing with um, uh, some telescopes that you have to consider. Also some require like, well, either require or you can't get a flattener that's not also a reducer, which impacts your effect of um, focal length. And then if you've got room in the imaging train, you might wanna add, think about filter slots or field rotators or well, you know, off access guiders or what is so slew of things you can put in between your optics and your sensor. Speaking of sensors, uh, cameras. Um, as you're taking a picture, they produce noise. Uh, just can't get away from that. The cooler the camera is, the less noise you'll get. Uh, I'm shooting with a, a DSLR right now and it, it's annoying. Uh, another factor is there's um, amp glow. I put amp in quotes, so I think that's uh, uh, not necessarily applicable to modern cameras technically. But anyway, it's interesting if you look at the uh, manufacturer sites that claim there's no amp glow, like the ones with amp glow, it's like a, from the side, like a starburst of light shooting out into the sensors. Um, there's some that are back illuminated sensors, which remove this glow completely. 
quantum efficiency or QE, which I initially thought was quality engineering until I looked it up and it's like, uh, this is a weird number. But it's the percentage of light that's actually captured uh, roughly uh, on your camera or on the sensor. So higher that is, the better, the more light you actually, uh, that's coming through your imaging or through your telescope is actually gonna be captured in the sensor. Full well is the amount of electrons captured before the sensor is saturated. So again, the more you can collect, the better. I think there's, I, as I said, I haven't gotten too deep into the camera space. So there's probably a upper limit to this based on the, uh, like the time you're gonna be capturing light and image, uh, sorry, um, light pollution and, and things like that. But I don't have the math for that yet. I'll update my spreadsheet at some point. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is astrophotography is not terrestrial photography. You can use any old camera and get results, um, but there's different concerns. And, and even within astrophotography, there's uh, nuances from what I'm, I'm reading. So your sensor, physical sensor size and the pixel size are pretty important. Uh, so the bigger the sensor, the more of your field of view you're gonna be capturing. Uh, smaller pixels, what I understand are better for planetary. Maybe somebody can correct me if I got this wrong, but, and then bigger pixels up to a point are better, better for deep space objects. Because um, with the stacking, you can drizzle and break them apart. And, all sorts of crazy stuff to, to get more detail back. Um, next. So environment, okay. So humidity is important uh, to watch out for. Um, your equipment's gonna radiate heat off into space basically throughout the night. Uh, if the dew point's high enough, will cause condensation. Condensation's bad. It, well, one, it's gonna block light. Uh, two, it's gonna make a mess. Three, you can uh, damage your optics uh, in your telescope if you don't clean it off, uh, even if you just let it dry from what I understand. And then the act of having to clean it is a risk in that you could introduce scratches into your lenses or your mirrors. So, uh, best to just not have that, this particular problem. But you know, as I said, it's bitten me a couple times already. And just a quick example of, this is on the, the Canon with the 300 millimeter lens, Pleiades. Uh, on the left before do, and then about an hour and a half later, I came out and was like, oh, it's wet. It's a problem. So it makes a, a huge, huge difference. Okay, so talked a bit about individual components, but they all need to work together. Um, I maybe overanalyze things and look at too much data, but this is the this is way I, I went about it. So I'm gonna share. Um, if you're going to use a computer to control your mount, you need to um, check that it's compatible. Um, ASCOM stuff's very well supported, uh, but check individual uh, your, your software you're using and make sure your mount is going to be usable with that software. If you're going to be using guiding, you'll need to look into this. Um, I'm not guiding yet, but I am using a laptop simply because I can be up in my study here and poke at what, what's going on in my backyard without having to clomp through the house. Um, so the mount and all the other stuff on top of it. So the first thing to think about for imaging is to target about 50% of the mount's payload capacity. Uh, taking this kind of like, uh, without digging too much into the why, my assumption is that you know, as you add, increase the payload, any of the errors, vibrations, et cetera, from the act of tracking are gonna be translated into errors in the image. Uh, you're going to have to power everything and just keep that in mind. So the mount, any of the cameras, do heaters and controllers, um, computer. Uh, right now I've got a, a drop cord running from an outlet in the out, outside of my house to the computer. 
um, in a, a battery for the mount. Um, but you need to, to figure out what you're, you're gonna need for imaging. Everything except for the computer is uh, generally 12 volts DC. Uh, sounds like uh, using watt hours to base the analysis on is better than amp hours, though um, the lithium batteries versus lead batteries seem to be a little bit different. So do some reading there because uh, amp hours can be misleading. Now, for example, one amp hour per amp drawn per hour. Okay, that's a little weird. Um, so for example, the, the target setup I have, the peak draw, which I don't expect to actually happen would be about 10 amp hours um, or 10 amps. So uh, I need to remove the H from that. So for four hours of imaging, I need 40 amp hours just to consider it. The battery I have right now couldn't do that, but I bought it because I like big lithium batteries. So happy. Um, and I've, I've read about the potential of powering your mount separately than everything else. Uh, I think the thinking here is if your mount stops working, uh, all your images are trash. But if your, Im uh, if your camera is intermittent because of power issues and your mount's still tracking, whatever you do get, probably going to be good. All right, suitability of your camera to your telescope, imaging camera to imaging telescope. There's a good calcula set of calculators on astronomy tools um, to take a look at. This is just one of those where you, you take the, the pixel size of your camera and divide it by the focal length and multiply it by this factor 206.265, which I haven't unpacked what that means. Um, and generally, anything so on this site you can select very poor seeing is like the worst option and any, that says anything um three arc seconds or lower is good for that so i i for my comparisons it's like i'm just going to say two arc seconds is probably good and then use that for just comparing different builds uh, for example the kit lens with the uh, Canon came in at 2.56, which is kind of okay. I'm um, using the Canon still with the Xenostar 73. That comes in at a 1.78, so that's cool. And then, you know, my hypothetical future world, maybe, I don't know, ASI uh, 533MC Pro with the Orion 10 inch astrograph, 0.77. I don't, I don't know if that is like, if there's a lower limit I need to worry about yet. So that's something else I need to, to dig into. Uh, Naveen. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and we've talked about this before. And I think you using two arc seconds is a good gauge for someone not familiar with the term seeing that's essentially the atmosphere you're imaging through is going to blur your image. So um, there is a limit to how much resolution you actually need because the atmosphere is going to degrade it anyway. Uh, I'll save you some trouble. There's no way that 10 inch is going to track on your EQ6. But uh, maybe if you get an yeah. AP 1100 or something, you might be in business. But uh, anyway, sorry, keep going. <laughs> yeah, I have it as my, I'm going to look at the spreadsheet and that's my example. I'm like, yeah, it's too heavy. <laughs> Spoiler. I have um, a 10 inch you can borrow if you want to try it. <laughs> After it crushes your mount, you can bring it back. But yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so next thing is if you're guiding, looking at like I found a, a post on cloudy nights, like what, it, what is a good metric for assessing whether your imaging scope and guiding scope setup are suitable? Um, take the focal lengths of each and the pixel size of each turn it through this equation. And according to that post, if it's less than three, it's really good. If it's less than five, it's okay. If it's bigger than five, not so good. Again, this is um, for me, like I just want some number that I can look at and do some comparisons. Uh, again, examples. Uh, the Canon with the Z73 is under the three and then my 
my hypothetical going to crush my mount option with a 10 inch astrograph 3.85. Okay, now we need to make a decision. What you, you, you know a lot, maybe done a lot of research. You've got a list of things you might wanna buy. So uh, how do you go about it? And like use other people's experiences, the, the just punchline. Like um, I've asked the club members here for advice. I've poked around on cloudy nights and there's a bunch of other forums like Stargazers Lounge and I don't know what else. So take a look, see what, other people are doing, if there's problems they've had, if they like it. Take a look at pictures. Um, so like Astrobin is a good source for you can just search for the telescope that you may be interested in, in buying or the camera or the combination of the two and see what other people are able to get. Um, and then I start off looking at um, uh, one particular telescope and uh, was brought to my attention. It might not be a healthy company. I'm not trying to pick on anything, but this is a, an example of uh, Mead filing for bankruptcy uh, a bit over a year ago. And just a thing to consider, like if they were to disappear, they lose support. So, And then when you've decided what you wanna buy, there's the where you buy, how you buy. Um, I wasn't able to find anything in anywhere close to North Carolina where I could go into a store and buy something. So it's online. So get some advice, take a look, call the, the, the company up, ask some questions, like how long is it going to take before they have it available? What's their return policies, support, uh, policies, um, how do they actually do returns if something was damaged or if you've decided you don't like it, what's the implications for restocking and all these types of things. And then for me, the buy once, cry once, I, I've, I have a sense of what I wanna do long-term. I'm starting small, I'm not guiding, so I don't have not gone into the, the camera space yet. I plan to, uh, I would like to, uh, but I approach it with, I'm gonna get the initial outlay, smaller initial cost, And then the benefit for me is like, I don't have as many variables to figure out because I'm totally new to the space. I don't know, like <laughs> until I think it was Tuesday, everything arrived. Until Tuesday, I had a couple of pieces of plastic with a, with a bolt between them, uh, <laughs> driven by a Raspberry Pi Pico. So um, trying to make sure that I can understand how, how well it works without too many variables in case there are problems. Um, Naveen. Right. Uh, I had a question. Um, did you consider used at all or did you just want to buy new so you had a return policy you were comfortable with? I it, it, I guess it's about personal joining. I'm, I'm okay buying new a lot of times. I think for an initial purchase, I'd rather go new. It's just producing number of things that can go wrong. I think if I were to um, get a, a mount in the future that could, you know, put a larger telescope on, I'd consider used a lot more strongly than that's just me. No, I, I kind of agree. Like if I were going to buy a guide scope or something, I'd probably look used, but for what the equipment you're getting, I, I agree. Having that return period is, is really a great thing. So. But and the reality is that the used market has dried up in concert with the new market drying up. So whereas mm -hmm. two, three years ago, it was pretty easy to get good gear on the used market. Right now, there's there's a pretty pronounced drought of used mm -hmm. equipment uh, available. Good point. Okay, yeah. Okay. I'm going to flip over to my crazy spreadsheet I shared. Yes? Yeah. Um... I mean, did that play into your decision as far as uh, did you find anything that uh, you wanted yet uh, because of uh, people being bored and staying at home, they bought up whatever <laughs> you were going to go with originally? Um, I actually was surprised when I made my purchase. I decided like I wasn't worried about the the lead time to acquire what I wanted. I, I went ahead and purchased what I wanted having called uh, the distributor and, and 
talking to them about what I should expect. Mm -hmm. um, I fully expected it to be two months <clears throat> or more before they sent anything at all. And they shipped it in four days. Oh, that's nice. So, Very good. Wow. Yeah. The only thing that, so because of the, the Canon, uh, I needed a, a M48 T-ring. That my my original purchase had a, a, a T ring that they didn't have in stock and didn't know when they were get. So I ordered a different one and then they canceled the the original one I'd ordered and then it just all shipped. So that's the only thing that slowed it down. Okay. The smallest, cheapest bit. Very good. Mm. Yeah. Um, but that is something too to consider. Like the are you a I want it now kind of person? Um, which I yes, I did want it now but I had spent enough time with the barn door tracker and messing around like that. <laughs> the, the strong desire was just a mild desire. And I was like, okay, I can wait now. I've waited this long. Okay, so hopefully the spreadsheet's visible. Um, I, this is not designed for uh, sharing so much as just for me to, to, uh, to take a look at numbers and whatnot. So, but I'm gonna walk through it and hopefully uh, uh, it's available for anybody to take a look at, copy it, edit it, and edit your copy if you want. But um, it's broken into a bunch of tabs and there's some hidden tabs as well for doing pivots and transposing some of this uh, data. Uh, got a caveat with this, like some of the fields I started not filling in because I didn't know what I needed to know when I first started trying to collect information. Uh, so how many USB ports, like at, for the mount, I just stopped caring. Like I started, it's like, it wasn't, it's not a factor for me anymore, but maybe you, maybe that's something important to you. But each tab is what it says that I lumped everything that isn't a mount telescope, camera, power computer into accessories. So that one's kind of crazy. And yeah, so I've started off with my barn door tracker, like. I did the math to figure out how much hardware actually costs. It ended up being $56. So that was pretty cool. Um, but that's yeah, the cost. You know, how much does it weigh? What is its payload? Those are the really big important things. Um, have a place to put notes if I don't you know, think I want it. Uh, it'll drop it out of the, the build tab, which uh, we'll go through these other ones first real quick. Uh, yeah, so, so just add in a new, you know, data in a new column and, and it'll automatically get sucked in. Telescope, same thing. Um, I really like the, the red cat, but decided it wouldn't, wouldn't be for me. But initially, like, what are the lenses like? Because I didn't know enough about it. Stopped really capturing that because it didn't matter anymore. Um, well, it comes down to the, the, the focal length and aperture and the weight. Well, well, the cost, everything in the cost matters. Cameras, a lot more here uh, of interest. And, and one thing on each of these tabs, like there's, there's um, the, the builds tab where you like, I want this camera and this telescope doesn't include all of this information. Uh, some of this is very subjective, it's all about what do you think is the best thing uh, about a particular device? Um, I've got a couple of you know generated fields down at the bottom, especially for cameras that I, I found interesting to take a look at, like the sensor size versus a full frame camera. Um, I added that in recently, and it's like, well, that's that's really fascinating. Like I I'm interested in the ASI uh, 533 MC Pro but versus a full frame camera, which I don't expect to get one, which is for comparative purposes, it's 15% of a full frame camera surface area. Um, so that, that, that one was kind of eye opening. The, the, the mini cameras for, for tracking are 2%. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it doesn't matter. Um, all right. So for these, of course, yeah, the cost, the the format doesn't go into the calculations. The really big important things uh, from a calculations point of view is the pixel size and resolution. Um, if you're gonna be doing planetary 
stuff as well. You know, the frames per second may be a factor. I don't, I don't know what the the bottom end of frames per second you'd want for planetary. I haven't looked at it. It's not not to say that I wouldn't look into doing that in the future, but it's not my key thing right now. Some of the subjective things, so the things you need to just ask yourself, like what is good to me, is the the full well and the QE. Uh, those are, you know, going to drive how 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 good of an image you get, or maybe, you know, how long of a sub you can take. Uh, a couple other little things, like does it come with an integrated dew heater? Some of the uh, ZWO cameras do. I don't honestly know how important that is, but it's kind of cool. Back illuminated sensor is interesting because it removes that amp glow. So those are ones that I'm more interested in personally. Um, yeah. Hey, uh, oh, Naveen, then, how much power it consumes? Uh, uh, yes. Naveen, how much, how much time did you uh, invest in this? This is an amazing uh, way to display this data. I think it's a great help for people to kind of look at what you've done here. So how much time do you think you invested in this? It's, it's amazing. Too much. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you made the barn door tracker like two months ago, right? So you've been really busy. This is, this is great. Yeah. And I, I agree. Most of the things that you have filled in are important. Um, you know, if budget is no concern, then obviously, uh, you can get more of those factors higher, but, um, there's always some compromise with, with money. And I think this is a good way to kind of lay all that out. Yep. I think as far as like putting the spreadsheet together, it didn't take me long to have a structure. Like I've done this kind of analysis a lot for other things like, house purchases to camera, uh, like phone purchases to all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's just the way my, my brain works. Uh, I, I need this. Um, I did spend a lot of time on it though. Not as much, I think, as tinkering with the barn door tracker itself. That one was quite a bit more of a project, but very fun. Um, okay, so let's see. Real quick power, not gonna get into it. Like the, the key thing here is figuring out for each of these items, how much uh, amp hour, so how long you could drive your rig. Uh, computers is very lightweight. I've just got <laughs> my T480 uh, laptop and an ASI Pro. Right? There's other options if you're interested. Uh, important from a power consumption point of view, if you're gonna put it on the, the mount. Accessories is a hot mess. I don't wanna get too deep into this. Um, I started getting lazy and didn't wanna have to create spreadsheets for every variant type of thing that you could possibly throw onto a rig. So filters, dew heaters, you know, protective lenses, autofocuser, cases to put stuff in, whatever, just kind of got dumped into this sheet. Uh, the key things here, if it's going on to the rig, onto the mount, how much does it weigh? Uh, and then if it's consuming power, how much power? Uh, a couple other columns I probably should just delete. They're not useful. Oh, if it's a reducer, that's important too. Okay. So that's the raw data. And then we get into how did I go from that into something useful? So I set up, um, what do they call this? Um, whatever, there's a hidden the thing here. I think it's validation, data validation. Yes, yeah, so you can do data validation and reference another set of fields somewhere in your sheet and get a drop down. So I can change out, you know, what camera or what scope, and then just reference that string down into other fields to pull in the relevant information to make calculations. So I start off with my, my no kit option. So my barn door tracker with the kit lens for the Canon um, the focal ratio, not so great, but it works. I've gotten pictures, so I can't say it wasn't useful. Uh, suitability that we saw in the spreadsheet earlier, same here. It's okay. Uh, how much does it weigh? It's pretty light. Uh, the barn door tracker can't hold a whole lot. So, um, we're at 33% of what I guesstimated it could take. No power, which is not really true, and the cost. 
so that's just the kind of gist of it is just run through this. It takes what the input up here, uh, drops it down into all these other places for you to take a look at and see how, how you like it. Because like I said, it's, it's very subjective in some areas. You know, you know, there's a balancing act of cost versus um, maximum that you can get out of a, a, a setup. But, but, um, so this is what I have now, uh, the EQR Pro. Xenostar 73 using the Canon. I got the Uniguide 50 millimeter. It's a 200 millimeter focal length guide scope. Uh, I said I'm using it as a find scope, finder scope, so I just stuck an eyepiece in it. I got the Celestron Power Tank Lithium Pro. Probably not going to be able to use that long term, but I really like it. I like big batteries like that. Uh, the field flattener, it's not a reducer, and then a T ring. So I'm kind of anal and I want everything in my list if I'm going to go buy stuff. Uh, takes that information, drops it down here. So we've got the imaging scope focal length, the guide scope focal length. Is there any multiplier to reduce the imaging scope? For this one, there's not. I just, um, as an example, well, actually, I can just change out this. Let's assume. So we have the, we had a reducer for this guy, it just would come in and say, oh, that's a 0.8x effective focal length drops, and then use that for the math. But that is actually not the case. How much does this all weigh? Ends up at 9.4-ish pounds. The amount can handle 44, so we're at 21 and change percent of what the thing can handle. Power for the mount, max draw is eight, uh, four amps. Doesn't draw nearly that much from what I've read and certainly not in the, the few times I've had it out so far tracking. Uh, how long could you image at that draw with the battery or the power source that you've selected? And then of course the big how much does it cost thing? So it just adds that all up. And the, I've I've taken the approach of like doing the thinking this in chunks. I, I don't know what I'm gonna do next. I think I've I feel like I need to make a decision on how I'm gonna power some do heaters. Do I wanna get a controller? Do I wanna get ASI or Pro? Um, do I want both long term? Like, does that even make sense? I don't know. So, but I've broken it out. Next step potentially is do heaters and then getting some, you know, guiding cameras. Um, so I just, you know, take this column, copied it over, switched out some stuff. So I add the, I decided hypo, you know, potentially I'll power the do heaters with the ASI Pro. Um, I want to get a, a different cord for the mount so I can connect it into the, 2.1 millimeter port on the battery, and then the two do heaters. Um, that doesn't really change anything other than a little bit of the weight and a little bit of the power. So I'm not going to scroll down. Going to guiding though and switching out the camera. So this is my the ASI uh, three uh, 533 MC Pro for the imaging camera, getting the uh, 290 mm mini for a guide camera, which we'll just plug into the guide scope I already got. No longer need the T-ring. Um, this camera doesn't have a dew heater, so I'm just assuming that's what something I'd want to get. I haven't decided yet. And then uh, everything's updated down here. So now that we have a guide scope, we get the imaging slash guide scope suitability calculated. So it's green, it's pretty good. Um, total weight goes up a bit. We're still well within bounds of what this mount can handle. Total power consumption goes up. And if it's at full draw, I've got under an hour and a half <laughs> with the battery I have right now. So I knew that going in, but you know, that's fine. And then rel the, this is total cost for the entire column. It's not doing deltas, but you compare to what you know, you've already sunk into the, the rig to see what the additional cost might be. 
Um, as was pointing out, the uh, 10 inch astrograph probably won't work. And I've actually set this up to kind of show that. Also picking a different camera. So this is a, a mono camera. I'm gonna ignore the cost because it's quite up there, but just wanted to add in say like the represent that get then you know, filter wheels with the filters. Um, just as a hypothetical decided, hey, I'm gonna go to an off axis guider. So drop out the scope or the guiding scope add in off axis guider. Uh, all the suitability for a camera and, and scope go are green. We've got better focal ratio, which is cool. Total weight gets up there though. We're at almost 70% of what the mount can handle. So this might be a bad idea. The, the bigger factor is the length of that OTA and how much a signal okay. it's gonna be. That, that's where you get in trouble. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, and the other thing is you're probably going to need a paracore if you're going to use that full full frame sensor, some sort of coma corrector, um, which you don't okay. have there yet, um, which yeah. will add some money. But that's a dream setup, and so yeah, it's fun to think about. I that's pretty that'd be a nice setup, you know, if you could figure out how to mount it. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought about how long the the scope is. That's definitely something to think about. Um, but just to kind of show like real quick, like, yeah, that's maybe not going to work out. I've put in a couple other things like there's the eight inch or which maybe still too long, just change it and everything recalculates, which is pretty cool. The, the eight inches I've, I've used an eight inch F4 on an Atlas mount before. And if with no wind, it's, it's doable. Okay. Um, all right. And that's, yeah, that's the sheet. That's how I approached it and am still approaching it. I, you know, my journey's not over. Well, that's, I mean, considering uh, just how long you've been doing this, I think you, you have obviously have some good analytic and critical skills to go through and look at a problem and, and kind of analyze how to approach it. I think you highlighted some really important factors. Um, if, if everybody did this, then we wouldn't have people joining the club who bought a SCT to start imaging with and don't understand why it doesn't work. So, uh, you know, this is a great way to sort of lay that out. Um, let's see. Uh, one thing I would add also, you said something about going to cloudy nights and talking to the club to get feedback. Something that people should also think about is if they're looking into a particular piece of equipment, I probably would guarantee that someone in a club has that and has taken data with that. And I'll speak for me and, and Ron here, but uh, we're happy to share any data at any time if someone wants to play with processing data from a particular camera and setup to see, you know, what that looks like, you know, uh, before buying all the equipment, obviously. So um, I talked about doing mentoring where maybe we even went out together to Big Woods and people could watch us set up and use the equipment and you know there'll be a time where hopefully we can revisit that but um uh so let me just open it up uh any questions for naveen about equipment choices or or anything else i, I have a comment about a real bang for the buck item and that is when you talk about the realities of do is the evil and you have to deal with it Several years ago, I came across these little pulse width modulator controls that you can find on Amazon for six bucks might buy you two of them. And these things are fantastic do heater controllers. One of them with a, with a good 12 volt uh, source behind it can run all the do heaters you'd ever want on all your OTAs. You got a little pot, you turn it to the level. It's a, uh, these things are great. I have a box so, of them because I misunderstood that for $10, you didn't get one, you got five. So I ordered uh, $30. So I had right. a, a, <laughs> a bucket of these. So, you know, you know, no <laughs> slam against the, the really cool Kendrick stuff that's out there, but you look at the non-computerized ones and you go, they're basically asking $130 for something that you can make for $3. Mm -hmm. Uh, because if you take it apart and look inside, it's not even as good as that. All they have is like a five, five, five timer and all that kind of stuff going on. So, uh, that's a good way to cut some costs. And making your own dew heaters is not difficult if you have some proficiency. So that's, that's another area. If you want to, uh, 
uh, get something up and going. You can certainly get a set of dew heater, dew straps for most telescopes for probably less than $60 if you know how to solder. Um, the other thing I was going to say, Naveen, is uh, Ron here is also been playing with big lithium batteries for a while. So you guys might want to compare notes if you want to talk about those. He's played oh. with a bunch of cheap ones and expensive ones. So uh, that would be, oh. that's a talk for another time, but. Uh, I'll add a comment about the dew heaters. Uh, Michael gave me a, a couple of his spare uh, PWM modules and I actually did a DIY on my straps and they, they work perfectly fine. Um, it's a great way to awesome. get it. I ended up getting a uh, dew controller used and uh, some regular dew shaps. So now I just keep the other ones as my backups, but they work, they worked perfectly fine, those PWMs. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. Um, let's see, uh, just looking over your list, a few things you didn't really address. Uh, one would be a way to make flats, which again is something you can kind of do DIY if you want. There are, yeah. again, pretty pricey solutions for that, but um, they do work extremely well. But if you're good at just connecting wires. Uh, you have something to show us or? I, I got a uh, tracing tablet Yep. for like eight bucks and I put a couple of sheets of paper with some uh, uh, tape. Oh, <laughs> my background <laughs> won't let us see it. <laughs> um, I'll stop it while I talk. Uh, yeah, just USB powered, real simple. Yeah, thing. excellent, excellent. Yeah. One of those two it was, uh, it was, yeah, it was pretty much like what you have there. And uh, what I did instead, though, because it was smaller than I got it, is one I had there, it's not the size of yours, Nadine, but uh, then when I got an iPad mini, I was just like, oh, hell, this is a lot smaller. <laughs> yeah. That's all I use. I mean, then again, I don't really, uh, have, uh, all my apertures are like uh, four, uh, four inches or smaller. So, I mean, I, I guess if you had a really, uh, whatever those XL size iPhones or something, you could probably use one of those too. Yeah, good point. Um, so I, I bought this tablet before I knew what I was doing. And it was because my kids had an eight inch, eight inch uh, Dobsonian. And I was like, well, this will fit on top of that. Let's see what I can do. <laughs> uh, but it's big enough. It works fine with the setup I have now. I have no, no complaints. Well, I, I, and one thing I want to comment on, you said earlier, you like to sort of do things, not necessarily the hard way, but actually kind of struggle a little and learn about how it works. Uh, I, I admire, you know, and applaud that kind of approach. I think there's a lot of things in this hobby you can experiment with and learn about, you know, before you go out and just spend money to solve a problem. If that's, if you enjoy that kind of challenge, there's, and that's what I still like about the hobby. The, the imaging part is kind of boring at times because I've done it. It's kind of easy now, but all the little pieces and parts that you integrate and I, I love just tinkering with new software. So uh, if you, that, that's a great way to, you know, enjoy the hobby also. And you've shown that. Yeah, good point. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yeah, I, I had a question for Naveen. Um, do you intend to keep your setup on your property and like driveway backyard scenario? Or have you thought about if you wanted to say, take it out to one of the lakes or go to a dark site, um, how would you make your rig mobile? I, I do plan probably to take it out. There's a, a boat landing near Harnett County, it's 30 minutes from me. That's pretty dark, much darker than here. That's a little bit Southwest of Harris Lake. Um, making it mobile, yeah. I don't, I don't have anything to put it all in. Um, the telescope came with a nice case. If you don't use your telescope, like, like it has a handle, you have to change things such that to put the handle on, you no longer can put it in the case, which is really annoying. And I've got the, the guide scope and I've got, you know, field flattener. So I don't, I, I plan on getting a case to put at least the telescope and other related things into. And then I got to figure out the mount as well. But worst case, I'll put it on my back seat in my car and carefully and take it out there some night soon, probably. But I don't know. That's kind of risky. Too. <laughs> I'd say worst case, yeah. buy a big Rubbermaid and put some blankets in it and wrap it up at least. But yeah, you'll, yeah. you'll find, like I found for my 70 millimeter scope, uh, they had an oversized uh, toolbox 
you know, at Lowe's right. with some foam and you have mm-hmm. to take the guide scope off. Um, but I don't have to take the camera off, which I think is important. You don't really want to be taking the imaging train apart if you can help it. But uh, with that, I can put it in this big old thing with some foam and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's pretty secure. But uh, I actually wanted to ask about imaging train and cameras. So you, you don't, you never take your cameras off? Uh, only if I'm going to image with a different telescope. Uh, you know, okay. I, I can reuse flats. Uh, you don't, you maintain your rotations. And the next time you go out and take images, you're. Mm. You don't let dust, dust. in. Yeah, dust. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, depending on what kind of cheap machine threadings things have on them, I'm not convinced when you thread things back that the tilt's going to be reproducible. I mean, these mm. are starting to get to be kind of esoteric things. But, you know, if you're really serious about the hobby, and as you've shown, you're going to invest a, a bit of money in it, right? Then, you know, they, you want to get the best you can. So most people tend to keep everything assembled. Um, that's yeah. not to say if you take yeah. it apart that something terrible is going to happen. You're just probably going to have to reshoot flats, you know, quite, uh, you know, regularly because they may not work from night to night. So this is this is my camera here. Uh, maybe we can see it. And so when I swapped it out from the one OTA to the next, it has to open right here. And so this is a coma corrector for a Newtonian. Before it had a you know a, a reducer uh, flattener for a refractor. And so when I open this up right here and put on this part, it's like clean as environment as you can and move like a bunny rabbit. Because if you unscrew this part, the dust is going to jump on to that stuff in there like crazy. And uh, it, it's not a big harm because if you shoot flats, you fix it. But you, you wanna do whatever you can to keep the, you know, the core part of the scope part really tight. Yeah. Good, good. All right. Uh, just. Yep. Any more comments or questions? This was really fun. I'm amazed by the spreadsheet. This is great. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know. I've been doing this a while, and I'm like, huh. I, I, I'd show I mean, you I my wish napkin that I plan my stuff out on, but I yeah, probably threw it away already. <laughs> I, I wish I had started the process like uh, you did, but when I began the process, I was probably in the third grade, you know, and making telescopes out of Quaker eight oats cans. <laughs> but, but, but the notion of, um, you know, buy once, cry once, I'm on my third iteration of that. So a- as you get further and further into it, it's like all of a sudden something will come along. But the good plus is quality astronomy gear will sell in less than an hour when you post it for a fair price. Good point. On like Astromart or Cloudy uh-huh. cloudy Nights. I mean, like uh, someone noted earlier today, you can't find any good used gear. It's, there's a dearth of it right now. So if you were to put a nice piece of kit on sale, it'll be bought before you walk downstairs and get a glass of water and come back. Good point. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah. If, if someone was interested in that spreadsheet, um, is that what, how could they get, is that something yeah. you're willing to share or? I, it's open to the world and I sent it to the imaging list. Okay. I think on oh, Monday. Good. Um, okay. I, I might've missed that, nice. but that, I appreciate you doing that. And yeah. uh, just yeah. want to say thanks to everyone for coming and just a uh, heads up probably next weekend. Uh, Ron here is going to talk about that image behind him. And I'll post details on that pretty soon. So thanks again for everyone coming. And Naveen, thank you for that awesome presentation. Yep. Happy to thank present you. Thank you, Naveen. Thanks, Naveen. Thanks, Naveen. Oh, very nice. Have a good day, guys. Bye, all. Yep. Thanks, See y'all. Bye.